Hello, and welcome everyone. My name is Eva Keitel, and I'm excited to be hosting today's webinar. Welcome to the CII's new benchmarking platform webinar. One of the things I'd like you to remember is we will make time for questions. So as they come to mind, please enter them in the panel box in your webinar view, and they will be answered at the conclusion of today's presentation. Our presenters are Mike Pappas, Associate Director for Deployment, and Deborah Degazelle, Manager of Information Services. I know that both Mike and Deborah have plenty of great things to cover, so without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Mike to begin. Thanks, Eva. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, a little bit about the history of CII and benchmarking. Um, you know, CII has been benchmarking for more than 20 years now. And it started out with the PAS system, performance assessment system. And the, the original intent for that was to benchmark the impact that CII practices, especially best practices, had on uh, project delivery objectives, you know, like cost, schedule, quality, and so forth. Um, we've also been benchmarking safety uh, since about 1990. And those of you that are familiar with CII, you know, you've seen those statistics, and and that's one of the things I know that the, the founder of CII, Richard Tucker, and and all the CII members are are pretty proud to have helped pull the industry safety statistics to where they are today compared to where they were you know, 30 years ago. Um, we also created the 1010 system um, a few years ago. And, you know, use of that has declined. Uh, there's a group in Norway that uses it regularly. Um, but other than that, people don't really use it. Um, the PAS is not used much. We did a pharma, um, a pharma benchmarking program for a while. And this participation dropped off. Uh, we started a healthcare benchmarking program. And, and that one's still going. Of course, it's our most recent program. But, um, you know, now that CII has, well, some things have happened that, um, you know, kind of make it necessary for us to change how we're approaching benchmarking. Um, a couple of the sectors are very interested in benchmarking, namely uh, facilities and healthcare. They want to continue the healthcare benchmarking. They also want to broaden that out to buildings in general. Um, MLS wants to continue or kind of resurrect the pharma program and also broaden out to other areas as well. And, you know, of course, for generic buildings, um, you know, that's probably something FHC and MLS will, will team up on. But some others, the other, the industrial sectors have also um, mentioned some interest in benchmarking uh, they're just not as far along yet with what they'd like to do. Um, and while we're on history, uh, we'll switch. Well, I'll switch to where we are now. But basically, um, we are past due for a new system uh, for a couple reasons. One is the existing system has been patched and upgraded, and you know, duct tape and bailing wire. Um, it's still limping along, but those of you that are interfacing with it, you know that it's limping along. Things like the data miner um, have gotten increasingly glitchy, for lack of a better term, in the last six months or so. Um, and, you know, frankly, our existing system's a little bit like, you know, the old story about, you know, I have my grandpa's ax and it's on its third head and its fourth handle, but, you know, it's still grandpa's ax, right? Um, this, our existing system is going to shut down on July 1st, and that's because there are no more patches, upgrades, um, warranty updates, you know, it's the software manufacturers have stopped supporting the, um, the products that we use and so forth. So that's number one, and that's the time critical part. Number two is obviously there are so much more capabilities today than there were than there was in the in the mid 90s when we started the PAS system. So um, 
And so I just want to give an example of that that's that's kind of current in the auto on the automotive industry. I read an article not long ago, and um, I was looking for it this morning because I don't remember all the details. But you know, General Motors is working on um, driverless vehicles, right, or self-driving cars, however you want to say that. And they took a look and they said, you know, hey, we have to have so many, you know, X million miles of self-driving car test data in order to kind of program the artificial intelligence, you know, smart enough that it can determine or, you know, that it's going to work, right? We have to give the AI that much experience, if you will, um, for it to be reliable. And then they took a look at it and they said, well, how long is it going to take us to drive that many million miles? And it was about 20 years. And they said, well, that's not going to work. So what they did was they contacted, um, I remember BMW is one of them. I forget what the other manufacturer is, but they contacted a couple other car manufacturers who are also working on self-driving vehicles. And of course, the data that the, each one of them have is their own data. It's competitive you know they're all in competition with each other um and so forth and and so it's a little bit of an analogy to you know our benchmarking with you know ci member companies providing data that's sensitive and and so forth um so what these auto manufacturers agreed to do was basically collaborate and use blockchain to uh to put their data together so that they can all share certain parts of the data. And, you know, this, they used a couple of terms, you know, the democratization of data or the decentralization of data kind of thing. Um, but the end result of that is all three of those manufacturers, and, and they're talking to others, but all three of the manufacturers that are participating in that, you know, when they pool their data, they're going to have enough data and, you know, well less than 20 years, you know, it's, it's something that is, um, you know, feasible from a business standpoint. Uh, but the only way they're doing that is by is by sharing their data. And they're protecting some of it, um, you know, using blockchain and whatnot. But perhaps, I mean, that's a current thing that is going on in the auto industry. And perhaps that's a little bit of, a, of an analogy to um, what we might be able to accomplish in uh in construction or capital projects benchmarking so at this point i'd like to turn it over to deborah de gazelle who can who's going to give you a quick overview of what our plan is at this point all right uh thank you mike appreciate it um so uh, i'm very happy to uh talk to you all today um some of you know that I've been involved in benchmarking in various capacities uh, since pretty much the beginning of the system and, and have different have had different roles uh, over the years. And so um, I'm very passionate about the subject and I'm, and I'm really excited about the opportunity to, to take us to really the next level of benchmarking. So what we're doing is uh, we're forming a member-led uh, couple of focus groups for this process. And that includes what we're calling the benchmarking users group, the bug, and the technical advisory group, the tag. And so that'll help us ensure that the system that we build is really responsive to member needs and that it also um, is really built to to last a number of years and it's flexible so that we don't run into the situation again where the system is aging out um, sort of like where we are today so uh mike gave you a little bit of an overview of the history thus far and i i wanted to expand on that just a little bit um, and talk to you about really how we're transforming the system in a in a pretty fundamental way. So the, the historical system was what we call a software as a service. And that basically means it was a website that people logged into and they entered data um, through web forms. And it was certainly an effective system. It, it let us collect uh, very highly validated 
um, data. Uh, and it was really the way things were done through the, the you know, the late 90s and the two, early 2000s. But as platforms and technology has advanced, um, the really the opportunities now are at the platform as a service uh, level. Basically, that allows us to provide a more flexible service. It will also allow us to rapidly ingest uh, data in a more of a big data sort of a framework. So there's a there's a lot of opportunities uh, to to really uh, expand and enrich the database like we've never had before. So just to talk a little bit about the benchmarking user group, they will be meeting with us to provide input and assistance. Um, they will be helping us to prior, prioritize the work to be accomplished. Um, They'll be working on defining use cases again so that we make sure that this system meets uh, sector needs and other member needs. And they should be uh, working with us to encourage participation because uh, the success of the system is really based upon the member input and, and participation. The technical advisory group will also be meeting with us and these are uh, people who are more uh, on the system sides of things. So they'll be working with us on the data architecture and the data model, giving us feedback. They'll be assisting with developing a robust master data management plan. And that really allows us to um, roll up the data to high levels and also record at very detailed levels. So it's it's extremely critical to, to be able to have a very flexible and powerful reporting and analysis system. So it's a it's a critical piece of of developing the platform. And they'll be giving us insight and testing and review and they'll also be working with us on the API and I've got a little bit more about that in a minute. So the, the bug and tag inaugural meeting is next week. We had great response. Uh, actually, we had more volunteers than we were able to accommodate. We're trying to keep the uh, group to a sort of a manageable um, size while having uh, participants from each of the participating benchmarking groups from the legacy platforms. So we've got a really strong group of both bug and tag members and uh, we're really looking forward to meeting with them next week. They'll be looking at the new benchmarking model. Uh, they'll be talking through benchmarking definitions and, and generally we'll be building from the definitions that we've uh, developed through the various programs over the last 20 years, reviewing that to make sure that it still applies and making any tweaks as necessary. We'll be having discussions about what does benchmarking on a big data platform look like We'll be talking about use cases and, and developing the execution plan. So at a high level, the vision for uh, the new benchmarking data platform has a few key objectives. Um, to develop an industry solution that builds on 20 years of experience. We have a lot of good experience, a lot of lessons learned through the years. And so. Uh, We've got a strong system and there's no reason to, to not build upon that. We'll be working on a plan to transition the existing uh, research partners and customers, you, the benchmarking community, to the new platform. We'll be deploying a new benchmarking API and that will allow us to collect data uh, from other systems that it won't be just web forms anymore. So that will help us to rapidly collect um, you know, maybe in a year we could, in the past, optimistically create or collect a hundred or two hundred projects. Maybe in the future we can do thousands of projects of year, per year, and that would really um, enrich the data set and provide uh, a very uh, fertile environment for for pretty detailed analysis to to levels that we've really just not been able to get to before. So that, that will very much support advanced research and, and be able to uh, get, us, get us a lot of new insights from the platform. So what is an API? An API, simply said, is a way to collect data. 
It's, uh, it stands for Application Programming Interface. And what the intention is, is to connect um, up to member systems to collect project data from uh, cost and scheduling systems. Um, it, it also involves collecting data from other data streams. So um, in the past, we've used like RS means data um, for cost normalization or cost data, and we've done all other normalization processes. So these can be collected uh, automat automatically. Um, we'll also provide other ways for um, the human interface to provide the best practice assessment and things like that. So, so there's a lot planned, but uh, it should really give us a, a opportunity to collect data in ways that we've never had before. Yeah, we realized that, you know, one of the limits on collecting data, you know, up until now is that everything has to be entered manually. And, you know, that takes time and, and, uh, and it's a little bit tedious sometimes. So, uh, we're, we think the automated feature of this, um, is going to be a big improvement. For sure. So uh, I just have a sort of a generic slide uh, about what a big data platform looks like and just trying to put a little bit of a CII spin on this, but, but at a high level, you've got data sources. It comes into the data store and, and events eventually comes into the database where through different, uh, you know, sorting and analytic techniques, uh, data sets can be published so that the end users uh, have access to that. So, so that's the basic idea. Um, for those of you who maybe are more on the technical side, I think this probably explains a lot, but um, it, this is the, the general vision for that. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on how that works for CII specifically. So we'll start with the data sources. Data comes in from a variety of systems from the members and elsewhere. It's then passed into the data warehouse, which is, you know, like a typical database, only scaled up for more data at a higher velocity and volume. Then it becomes available to our research associates. So um, that's the CII staff, that's the uh, academics that, uh, for example, work, work with uh, facilities and healthcare sector, um, they can do special analysis, they can produce special reports, and then at the end, it's passed over uh, to a web portal where the end users, the CII benchmarkers, have access to those data sets, and at which point you, you could download that um, into your BI tools to do your own special analysis. So just to expand a little bit on that, uh, the data sources could be are coming through the benchmarking API that we will publish. It can come from uh, Qualtrics or Excel surveys. Uh, it could come from company systems. We are still gonna keep the 1010 system live, so that'll also be a front-end web form that uh, will be available. And then there's other data streams, and this is really one of the advantages of this new platform, is that we can uh, potentially, in later phases, in just uh, cost data, currency, even other things like weather and seismic, because um, you know certainly we all know that that weather impacts productivity of installation in the field, and so that will help us understand is the our productivity factors due to inclement weather, or is it a, you know and help us really find out is it is it weather or is it management or is it other other issues that kind of thing. The data goes into the project warehouse, and it then is put into different characteristics, cost and schedule. And so for those of you who benchmarked with us in the past, you should be pretty familiar with a lot of these um, uh, basic categories for benchmarking. And then, of course, the data, data streams will also be coming into it as well. From there, uh, the data is made available to the research associates so that they can manage and publish data sets. They can do computation and analysis and um, use some other visualization tools. 
and then make it available to the end users with uh, reports and data sets. So much like the previous systems, if you submit data, you have access to your own data, but then you would also have access to aggregated data for sector programs that you may be participating in and other published data that we've provided. So the, the research associates actually will have a special level of access where they can do more advanced analysis. This gets into the, you know, the regression analysis where you're really trying to infer um, some correlations and potentially causation of, of different uh, project factors. And they would be able to publish special data sets for facilities in healthcare and MLS and, and 1010 and, and really any other future uh, benchmarkers that uh, want to get involved with us. So uh, we're starting in phase one, and that, that really is the intent of that is to configure the initial web portal to set up the database and to set up the API. And from there, uh, we'll be planning and estimating for phase two. Uh, so that's really where we are now. Phase two and beyond is just intended to expand the API and the services to develop reporting and to complete the legacy benchmarking imports. So, um, you know, as we mentioned, we've been collecting data for 20 years and we do intend to map that old project data into the new system so that we can keep building on the successes that we've had from the past. And of course, those of you who have projects specifically, you would have access to your, your data. So that is uh, our presentation and we certainly look forward to hearing about questions. Okay, so those of you who are on the webinar, please go ahead and enter your questions. We do have a couple, so I'm going to begin with the question to Mike and Deborah. What is the timeline of which to begin really in this process to start all of the exciting aspects that you shared? Well, we're starting phase one now, and in phase one, the need for that is really the if you will, the time crunch or the quasi-emergency situation we have with our existing systems going offline July 1st. So um, it's kind of a minimal emergency type approach uh, in terms of the actual work that, that we're gonna do. Um, and then of course, the, the real significant part of phase one is going to be scoping phase two, which is more, you know, if you want to think about that in terms of the final product. And that's where we've got the bug and the tag, those user groups to help us um, to provide input to help us shape what that phase two is going to look like. We also want to point out that, you know, uh, a number of you are probably, you know, benchmarking associates or, you know, are interested in benchmarking for your own companies. We're in, we, we need input from all of you. Um, we can't, however, have, you know, a 60-person bug and tag um, because that just gets unwieldy. So we've, we're kind of treating the, the bug and the tag as, as a core group, if you will, um, keeping those fairly small. But we do want input from everybody who wants to provide it. And so at various times, um, you'll see, you know, an email come out or I guess an email probably, you know, asking for input, you know, hey, we're discussing these particular features, you know, please provide us input on these if you, you know, if you have input on them. So uh, we want, you know, we, customers need to be heard and we know that. And, you know, frankly, we need to, um, you know, build something that's gonna meet the members' needs we don't want to think this up in a silo. Okay, so the next question is, how are you ensuring data quality and standardization given the number of inputs and options? Well, that's a really good question. And um, that, that's certainly fundamental to uh, what we're 
what we're working on um, in, in the database and with the, the tag. So uh, as you may know, we've historically had the web forms, which were very highly validated. And uh, we spent a lot of time on each and every project, making sure that the data made sense, that it didn't, you know, there weren't errors and things like that. So, so this does provide a, an interesting new challenge for us. Um, we do expect some of the data will, will still be the high confidence kind, but when you're getting into higher velocity and volume, you certainly don't have the time to, to look over the data uh, as you used to. So we're, we're working on some approaches um, to, uh, to use some uh, grouping techniques and to make sure that when we're looking at different categories of data that it does meet the standards and that it, um, it falls into expected ranges. We'll be working on techniques to have it flag things that are outside of what was expected. There'll be different validation algorithms in place uh, to, to, to flag them. Um, and there will be also times where we're collecting data, maybe from third party streams, where it's a, it's a lot of data, but it may not have as high of a confidence level. And so we'll be working to figure out ways to, to say, okay, well, this data from this data stream, we have extremely high confidence in, um, but in certain other data streams, we may have lower confidence. And so we would actually explicitly uh, put that into the system so that when we're doing aggregating and grouping that we would understand that, okay, you know, we have to have a little bit of caution here and there. Okay. So another question is, would the existing data and projects in the old system be migrated over or will we lose any of that original project data from the last 10 years? So that's that's also a great question. We are we are definitely working on mapping the data over from the 1010 system and the legacy performance assessment systems. So we're expecting to migrate all the projects. Um, there's a lot of data there from the different sector programs, the best practices programs. Uh, so so we're we're working on mapping all that data into the new database. Excellent. So our final question, we do have um, some additional questions that have come through, and what we will do is at the uh, conclusion of the broadcast, we will respond to those questions individually. But um, the final question is, how will we be informed of updates as the system develops? Well, we're planning on having more webinars just like this one, so uh, keep an eye open uh, for your email to see uh, as, the, as they're scheduled. Uh, we'll probably also be uh, putting in some blog posts and social media and because we definitely want to keep the user community informed. And also, if you, uh, if you want to stay informed, uh, just let us know, you know, raise your hand and, and give us your name and we'll be sure to, to keep you in the loop. And we'll, and we'll also be keeping the sectors informed of our progress. Uh, so if you're involved with the sector, uh, you ought to be able to get current information that way as well. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. And I would like to thank you on behalf of CII and all of the attendees. Let's say thank you to Mike and Deborah for this presentation. It was very informative and quite insightful. A big thank you for the attendees for spending time today. And just so you know, this will be recorded and posted on the CII webpage later this week, so you will be able to see it again and share with colleagues. Thank you all very much and have a great day.